Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the program in public health seminar series. My name is Dele Ogunsheto. I'm chair of the uh, department in uh, public health, population health, and disease prevention. This is a very special occasion for us, and I'm delighted to see the turnout uh, in the audience. I know more people are coming in, so I'm going to prolong my introduction a little bit just to make sure everyone sets it down by the time our uh, distinguished speaker takes the podium. Uh, as usual, this seminar series uh, is successful because of the contributions of many of our faculty members and students across campus who feel very passionate about specific uh, public health questions that they'd like uh, to illuminate with the minds of people who dedicated their lives to healthcare in various sectors of our society. Uh, today's uh, presentation would not have been possible without the uh, nomination that we received from Dr. Madeline Powell, who is in the uh, nephrology program uh, in the School of Medicine. And uh, she is also the director of what we call the Roots Program for the Institute for Clinical and Translational Science, which is how I got to uh, know and work with her. So Dr. Madeline Powell uh, uh, nominated our speaker. Uh, but that also means that our speaker gets to do double duty. He's already been at the Orange County uh, Medical Center, UCI Medical Center in Orange this morning to talk to the physicians and healthcare providers there. So we are very uh, fortunate to have him uh, here today uh, to speak to the main campus uh, public health uh, students, faculty, and friends. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Jesse Loboski earned his Bachelor of Science degree in professional, pre-professional studies, which is, I imagine, equivalent to our public health type um, bachelor's programs. Uh, but he got his at the University of Notre Dame and his doctorate of medicine from the University of California, Irvine. So he knows very well how to do that uh, zot, zot, zot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he may be rusty a little bit, but we'll teach him again before he leaves. Uh, then he, uh, where, when he was here, he had a distinguished uh, career as a medical uh, school student. He received the J. Gordon Hatfield Award for Outstanding Student in the Field of Surgery. As a surgical intern at the UCI Medical Center, where he was this morning, he was also named the resident of the year. He completed his neurosurgical residency at the University of Iowa, and at there he was resident of the Department of Surgery's Outstanding Resident Research Award. Dr. Loboski currently serves as Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery at UC San Francisco, and he is co-director of the Neurotrauma Intensive Care Unit at NT Enlo Memorial Hospital. He has served on the board of directors for the Joint Section on Trauma and crit Critical Care for the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Dr. Loboski served as one of organize neurosurgery's six representatives to the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma that advises on national policy and policy makers on healthcare issues. He has received national and international acclaim for his work on injury prevention, and he's been invited lecturer throughout the US and abroad, and is on the who's who in American medicine profile. He has served as the chairman of the board of the National Injury Prevention Foundation and has written a variety of research articles in national journals, several book chapters, and a book on health crisis in America's trauma system. He's received numerous awards for his contributions to the field of trauma and injury prevention and in 2007, he was recognized for his distinguished teaching experience by the students 
and faculty of the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. When I asked him, as we usually do, to uh, make sure he brings his thumb drive and we have all kinds of audiovisual equipment in the room, he says he doesn't need any of that. So that just tells you how brave uh, a teacher he is. And we look forward to that presentation this morning. Uh, there are two people I'd like to, two groups I'd like to thank before we resume. Uh, the UC Irvine Open Cosplay Program, which is run by the Office of Extension, helps us record this so that those who are not able to join us physically in the room will have the opportunity to hear uh, Dr. Lobowski's talk. And we always are grateful for that uh, service to our community at large. Uh, secondly, um, Dr. Lobowski is the author of a new book, It's Enough to Make You Sick, The Failure of American Healthcare and a Prescription for the Cure. Uh, my second thanks go to the UCI bookstore for having a little kiosk out there and they worked very quickly to make sure we have copies of the book available for you if you'd like to pursue this topic further and have uh, discussions uh, with Dr. Dobrowski uh, outside of the classroom. Um, this also brings me to uh, my uh, lengthy introduction because I really want him to autograph my copy right now before he starts lecturing. Please welcome Dr. Lobowski and I say Thank you. Thank you, Delhi. Well, fortunately, I don't have to talk that long now because Delhi's introduction was about twice as long as what my speech is going to be today. Um, I really do want to um, uh, thank Delhi, the Department of Public Health, uh, uh, Madeline Paul, and all of you at Irvine. It's, I actually haven't been back to campus since I uh, finished my internship, and so it's, it's really amazing to come back and see how the campus has changed in the four years since I've been here. Uh, it's amazing, both not here on the campus, but also at the, the UCI Medical Center. It's changed dramatically since then. Um, a little bit about my background. I, I'm not a healthcare policy expert. Um, what I do is I actually a physician that practices real-time medicine in the community. I'm a community neurosurgeon. I have four partners. My primary interests are neuro-oncology and neurotrauma. Um, and I teach at UCSF. In addition, outside of that, I, in the other, other hats that I wear, I have this interest in healthcare policy. And what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the new health care law. The book that, that Daly had um, referred to is really divided into two sections. The first part of the book kind of explains or tries to explain to all of us how we got into this mess. Tries to debunk the myth that America has the greatest health care system in the world. And then the second half of the book tries to tell you how we can properly fix it from the perspective of somebody that's working in the trenches. Now, I, I hope that I don't have to begin uh, this afternoon's presentation by convincing anybody here that the health care system that we have in this country is severely broken and badly in need of repair. I could spend probably a couple hours citing the shortcomings, but think about it for a second. This is a health care system. This is a health care system that pays spends about twice as much per capita on health care than almost any other industrialized country and yet is mediocre in terms of its outcome when you compare ourselves to the, to the World Health Organization's outcomes for health in their indices. This is a health care system which is anchored in an insurance industry that for years has been denying policies to people who had pre-existing conditions, such as high blood pressure or diabetes, and actually needed care the most. This is a system that is supported by a pharmaceutical industry 
that has lost its focus. That pretty much now the majority of the drugs that they produce that are far the, the, the affordability for many of our seniors, those drugs are nothing more than copycat drugs or what we call Me Too drugs that are not much better than what's currently available. This is a system in which our doctors are no longer doctors. We've become health care providers. And you, my patients, are no longer my patient. You're a consumer. And that has frayed, frayed the very fabric of the doctor-patient relationship. It's a system in which our hospitals are increasingly becoming for-profit entities that, again, change their focus, originally being the community of patients within their geographic area to being the community of investors who invest in them. We have politicians. We have politicians that work in a, a system that is so corrupt that I can buy myself a senator and you can buy yourself a senator to make sure that real effective change is never going to see the light of day. And lastly, we've got a population of patients who increasingly enjoy looking at themselves as victims of the healthcare system. And yet, these are patients who are growing more and more obese every day and who don't want to take any responsibility for their care, but instead rely on the system to make them whole. So I would contend that certainly health care in the United States really isn't the best system in the world. Now when you think, when you think about reforming a system that is so large, so cumbersome, so expensive, and yet so vital to our population, it appears certainly on the surface to be a daunting task. But I would suggest to all of you that it doesn't need to be as complicated as we make it out. As far as I'm concerned, there are three basic principles that need to be addressed to make sure that health care reform is effective and efficient. The first of those is universal coverage. Making sure that every person in this country has insurance. It's a pretty good thing. The second principle, and probably equally important, is universal access. It does you no good to have an insurance card if no provider will see you because the reimbursement rates are so poor. And third, and probably the most important, is controlling the enormous costs associated with health care. We have got to get those costs under control. Now those of you that paid attention four years ago during the presidential election of 2008, you heard all of the candidates, all of the candidates on both sides of the aisle, tell us what their individual vision was for health care reform. And Senator Barack Obama, who was the candidate Barack Obama at that time, I think very clearly and honestly delineated for each and every one of us what he would do, what his vision was for reforming our system. He said, A, it's got to be mandatory. Everybody's got to play in the game. There's no free lunch. B, for this system to work, we've got to have a public option, a government option of health care that will go in and compete with the private sector with the insurance companies that have been increasingly denying policies or pricing policies out of reach to many Americans. Third, he said it was essential that we allowed the federal Medicare program, the program for the elderly, to negotiate the cost of prescription drugs, just like every single other insurance company is allowed to do. He said it was time that we started focusing on evidence-based medicine and that we started focusing our attention on prevention. We as Americans sat back, we listened to the debate, we heard all of these candidates tell us what they wanted to do, we heard Barack Obama clearly tell us what he would do if we elected him. And then we elected him. We elected him. He told us, I'm going to do this if you put me in. We put him in. And no sooner, no sooner did he begin to implement those very programs he told us he would do, when all of the special interests in, in health care begin to rear their ugly heads and circle the wagons to make sure that their piece of the health care pie was protected. 
And before long, we were all told that the plan that President Obama had for us was nothing more than socialized medicine, the government takeover of health care. Not surprisingly, support for his program began to wane. And when it began to wane, Obama, who came into office promising all of us a new day, saying, I'm bringing in a new administration of transparency that's going to do business differently, found that they did nothing but what everybody else did, was retreat to those smoke-filled back rooms and cut deals with each of those special interests just to make sure that some type of a bill got passed. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what came out of that process was the Patient Protection and the Affordable Care Act, signed into law amid much fanfare by President Obama in March of 2010. So what I'd like to do for the rest of our time is talk a little bit about this law and ask ourselves, is this law going to be effective in addressing those three basic principles that are necessary for health care reform? Now, if we look at the first of those, universal coverage, I think the law does a great job of doing that. Through a variety of machinations, this law is going to take the nearly 50 million Americans in this country, or 50 million people in this country who are uninsured, and by the year 2019, it's going to convert about 35 million of them into the insured group. That's really a good thing. That's a good thing. Now, there are still going to be about 12 or 13 million people who aren't going to have insurance, and those are illegal aliens who are prohibited from participating in this process. But the vast majority of American citizens are going to have insurance. So what we can do is we can stand up on our podiums like President Obama did and raise our hands in the air with an entourage of people behind us and say, hip, hip, hooray. We've reformed health care and Americans now have insurance. But I would suggest that we may not jump that bandwagon right away. Because if you look at the second principle, the principle of universal access, this is where the law begins to fall down, at least in my opinion. Unfortunately, the majority of these newly insured Americans are going to be insured simply by lowering the eligibility requirement for the federal Medicaid program. Now, I don't know how many of you today here in the audience know much about Medicaid, but in California it's called Medi-Cal. And I would ask each and every one of you to imagine what it's like to have a Medi-Cal card. Try to see a high-quality primary care doctor. Try to see one of the better specialists. Try to get your mammogram on a timely basis. Try to get an MRI scan for your child. It's near impossible. It's near impossible. And what we're doing to these people is we're pulling a smoke and mirror we're pulling a smoke and mirror move on them. We're saying, hey, guess what? Here's a baseball cap, here's a jersey. We shake their hand and we tell them, welcome to the team. But very few of these people are going to get a chance to get into the game. Now the second problem, as I see it, with access, with access, is the fact that the majority, uh, the, the major way that the administration plans to pay for this expansion of health care to all is by reducing, reducing reimbursement to physicians and other providers and to hospitals. Now, as a physician in private practice, I can tell all of you that Medicare pays us relatively marginally, and it's the, the private insurance companies that make up the difference called cost sharing or cost shifting. And if they come and cut Medicare fees to us by 29%, which is what the, the current plan is over the next several years, our Medicare patients, our seniors are going to be in the exact same boat as those Medi-Cal patients. They're going to have a shiny, bright insurance card, but nobody's going to see them. So I think access is a huge problem. So the question is, is it even possible? I mean, how can you, is it possible to design a healthcare system that provides both of those principles, universal coverage and universal access? Well, of course you can. Of course you can. The United States is the only industrialized country in the entire planet 
that doesn't do that. We're the only one. So sure you can do it. The question is how? Well, if you happen to be a conservative and you like to listen to Fox News, then you're going to come over here and you're going to say, here's what you do. You let the market take us where we need to go. Market-based medicine is the answer to our woes. The, market, the free market system works well and we should allow the free market system the free reign to take medicine where it needs to go and thus increase quality and decrease cost. Now, this is a healthcare system and a market that you want me to trust that says, by the way, if you have high blood pressure, you don't get an insurance policy. This is a market that says, I'm going to advertise to you on TV all these drugs that you really don't need and really aren't any better than what's on the market, but they're more expensive because you know, the others are going off into generics. This is the market that you want us to do, to, to believe and to trust. Now, if you're selling me a refrigerator or if you're selling me a car, then that's fine, but not when we're dealing with people's health. Oh, if you're a bleeding heart liberal and you want to sit on the other side of the aisle, you can raise your hand and say, I got the answer. It's single payer. Single payer is perfect. And I'm going to tell you that when I've done research and looked at this over the last several years, there is a lot about a single payer system that acquits itself and, and really makes a lot of sense. For example, single payer would be designed so that everybody in this country, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, you have insurance. And it would probably be putting everybody in the federal Medicare system. Now, that's good for two reasons. Number one, all of a sudden you have universal coverage. And number two, if everybody has the same insurance, you've got universal access. You don't have that dichotomy. Number th the third point is that with with um, a single-payer system. They have the economy of means to negotiate contracts better because their population is so high that they can control the market. And number four, currently in my practice, I have 40 or 50 different insurance companies that I have to deal with, that my staff deals with, each of which has their own set of rules, their own set of fee schedules, their own, their own regulations, becoming a bureaucratic nightmare and running up the cost of my overhead. If I had one, insurance company, there was one set of rules, one set of forms, one set of fee schedules, simplifying it and streamlining it. So single payer makes a lot of sense. However, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a CEO of a hospital, if I run a pharmaceutical company or I make artificial hips, the idea of a single payer strikes terror in my chest. Because at the end of the day, the single payer is nothing more than a monopoly with all the inherent risks that a monopoly presents. The other thing that I talk to my, my colleagues that really push the single payer, I've spoken at a couple of large single payer, I've been in debates with the single payer uh, advocates, is that we've been talking about a single payer system in this country since 1948. And we're now closer to a single payer now than we were 60 years ago. And so it's a bit, from a practical point of view, it's a bit um, impractical to think that it's going to move any further than it has. So we have to think about other ways of doing it. So what are these other ways? Well, Barack Obama had another way. When he was running, he said he's going to create a government option. A government insurance policy, a government insurance company that will compete with the health nets and the blue crosses and the Aetnas of the world. Compete in the marketplace. Now, what we were told was by both the American Medical Association, the insurance industry, and the like, is that, oh my God, this is socialized medicine. So the government takeover of healthcare. Now, if you use the word socialized medicine to uh, criticize a program, it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed to make sure that it's not going to pass. Now, it's, I find it very interesting that these same entities didn't have a problem with a government entity for the elderly, the Medicare program. You know, there was no hue and cry about, oh no, you know, we, we don't want that. No, the Medicare program is just fine for them. Now why is that? Well, because the people in the Medicare program are elderly or they're disabled, they're on fixed incomes, 
They are the largest single utilizer of health care resources in the system. Now, you know what? Government option is just fine for them. And they don't have a problem with a government option for the poor, for the poor, for the indigent, the Medicaid program. No, that's fine. I think a government option is really good for that. Why is that? Well, they don't have the money to pay for these expensive tests, and they don't have the money for these policies. So a government option there is, bad, is, bad, is, is fine. What they really do is have a problem with a government option for you. The people in the middle. People who are A, relatively young, B, relatively healthy, and thus C, relatively low utilizers of healthcare resources, pay their premiums, or either have their premiums paid by their employers. And the reason that they oppose a government option in that market is that's where all of the profit is made in medicine. So it shouldn't be surprising. We could do what Senator Dianne Feinstein recommended, which I actually thought was a pretty brilliant compromise. And that was to say every single insurance company in the United States must be nonprofit. Must be nonprofit. What does that do? Overnight, with the flip of a switch, you change their focus. You change the focus. Those insurance companies are now responsible to their patients, not to their shareholders. And you know, don't get angry. Don't get angry with the insurance companies because they deny coverage to people or rescind their care. You've got to understand that in the for-profit arena, they are legally, they are legally, they have a legal fiduciary responsibility primarily to their shareholders. So as long as they're going to be for profit, they have to legally address their shareholders' interests first. So that shouldn't surprise us. But of course, that plan went nowhere either. Now I thought another possible compromise was to say, okay, you guys think you've got this figured out. Let's create a government option. Let's put it up here on the shelf, have it ready to go. And we'll set timetables and benchmarks. And if you don't reach these benchmarks by this timetable, this government option gets to kick in. So yes, it is possible to have both of those. But the third component, which is I really think is the elephant in the room when we're talking about health care, and this may be where this, this plan really does its, its worst job, and that is controlling, controlling the enormous costs associated with providing care. You know, we're spending about $2.7 trillion a year. We're spending over $8,000 per year per person. We're spending about 18% of our gross domestic product on health care. If we continue on that road in a short period of time, the health care budget is going to cannibalize all discretionary funds in this country to the detriment of national defense, of infrastructure, of technology, of education. And we're going to find as a country that we're not going to be able to compete in the global market anymore because of the high costs associated with health care. So this is something that we really need to fix. Now, how do you fix it? Now, if Daly doesn't mind, I'd like to spend the next 11 hours <laughs> talking to you on how we fix health care. But since our time is a bit limited, I'm going to try to um, truncate that a little bit and just talk about several areas where I think that we can improve things. And I'm going to start with the pharmaceutical industry, not because I think they're the most egregious, I just, it's a good place to start. Over the last 30 years, pharmaceuticals have become some of the most successful corporate entities in this country, surpassing at times even the financial industry in terms of their profit margins. But the ironic thing is, is that as our, as our uh, pharmaceutical companies became more and more successful, the costs of their products went higher and higher and higher to the point that now many Americans, especially our elderly, are having to choose between paying their heating bills or paying for their heart medicines. Paying for their heart medicines. But I think that the big change, the, the sea change for this was really in 1997. Prior to that year, it was illegal in the United States for pharmaceutical companies to do direct-to-consumer advertising of, pharma of, of prescription drugs. There was only one country in the entire world that allowed that, and that was New Zealand. And there's a reason for that. 
But thanks to the pharmaceutical lobbyists and the money that they paid to their congressmen and senators, they, pat, they rescinded that ban in 1997. Now, what was the result of that? We were told this was going to be great. The, the pharmaceutical industry said, we're going to be able to educate the public about pharmaceut pharmaceuticals, and all we have to do is tell them, go ask your doctor. What's wrong with that? Well, in the first nine years that this, bill got, that this ban got lifted, from 1997 to 2006, the average cost of a prescription drug in this country went from $30 to $68. Spending on pharmaceuticals in this country went from about uh, $79 billion to almost $300 billion. And the, ad, the advertising budgets of our pharmaceutical companies went from about three quarters of a billion dollars to almost $5 billion. And this was in a short nine year period of time. Now, there is a good side to this. Because of all this advertising, my wife, myself, my children, and my grandchildren all know what to do with an erection that lasts more than four hours. <laughs> so I think the very first thing I would do, if I had the power, is I would reinstate the ban on direct-to-consumer advertising. It's got to stop. Uh, you know, as, as arrogant as this may sound, the person who's in the best position, who's in the best position to know what works for you is your doc, is your doc. The rest of us are all being held captive by these slick Madison Avenue ads. So I would rescind that. I would rescind that. And let them take their advertising money and let them put it back into research and development. Let them put it back into research and development. Number two, it's unconscionable that Medicare has been prohibited, even in the new health care law, has been prohibited from negotiating the cost of a prescription drug. Every other insurance company, HealthNet can do that. HealthNet can go to Pfizer and say, I've got six million lives and I want your blood pressure medicine pill, but I'm not going to pay $10 a pill. If you want my six million lives, you want to be in my formulary, I want, I want a break. I want to only pay $7 for that pill. Now, Medicare has 60 million lives. Imagine what kind of market strength that would be. But back when George Bush II passed his Prescription Drug Act, which, by the way, was written by the pharmaceutical industry, in it were two provisions. One, prohibiting Medicare from negotiating the cost of drugs, and number two, prohibiting Americans from buying drugs from Canada. So I would change that immediately. You know, even conservative estimates suggest that if that's all you do differently, is let them negotiate the cost of drugs, the savings will be somewhere between 70 and 100 uh, billion dollars a year. Almost a trillion dollars over the next decade. That's huge. That's huge. Okay, number two. Most of the drugs that are coming down our pipeline are not life-saving drugs that are gonna cure cancer are going to change autism, are going to make diabetes a thing of the past. Most drugs that are coming down the market are nothing more than replications of drugs that are currently on the market, but are soon to go off patent. And when they go off patent and go to generic, the price drops dramatically. So what they do is they tweak a few molecules here and there, and they tell you this is the new wonder drug. You know, Prilosec was a good drug while it was under patent, but now that it's a generic, Prilosec's a bad drug. You need Prilosec SR, the new drug. This is what we're being told. I would suggest that the FDA should not approve a new drug unless it can be proven to be better than what's on the market. Currently, all you need to do is prove that it's better than a placebo, better than a sugar pill. That's got to stop. The th now, if we're going to do this, if we're going to tell our pharmaceutical companies that you know, we're going to change these laws, we have to be fair to them. And I, would, I have no problem, although many other people do, I have no problem with increasing patents on drugs another five to seven years. You know, if these companies are going to put their time and their treasure into making drugs, many of which are never made to the market, the very least we can do is to make sure that they get an adequate return on their investment. And the other thing I would do is immunize 
I would immunize the pharmaceutical companies from lawsuits. If a drug that came to market and went through the FDA process, years on the market was then found to have a side effect or a complication that was not apparent during those FDA trials, they should be immunized from lawsuits. Now, if those companies had that information and covered it up, go after them with full guns and take everything they got. I'm fine with that. So that's what I would do to the pharmaceutical industry. The second issue I want to talk about is defensive medicine and medical malpractice. If you're a doc like me, whenever anybody says to you, how do you fix the system? We don't address that people don't have insurance. We don't address that pharmaceutical costs are too high. What we address is malpractice. We said, all you got to do is go after the lawyers and we're going to be fine. And unfortunately, much of organized medicine's mantra has been, go after the lawyers, go after the lawyers, go after the lawyers. Ladies and gentlemen, we're operating, we're operating in a tort system that's nothing more than a lottery. It's a lottery that, A, doesn't protect good doctors from frivolous lawsuits. But equally important is that it doesn't protect patients from negligent care. 83% of people who get injured as a result of a medical mistake or medical negligence never even file a lawsuit. So this isn't working for either side except for the attorneys in the middle. Now how do we change that? Well, you know, I think it's really interesting that a, a health care bill that is so important as ours was, this new health care bill, has nothing essentially nothing in it about tort reform. Now why is that? Well, during the presidential election of 2008, the trial lawyers in the United States gave about $300 million in campaign contributions to candidates. And about 80 to 90 percent of that ca campaign money went to Democrats. And since the Democrats wrote the bill, it isn't surprising that there's nothing in the bill about changing the tort reform system. That's how we operate. Now what can we do to change this? Well, number one, we can set up malpractice courts so that if you sue me for malpractice, your case goes in front of a group of either you know, seasoned or retired judges, lawyers, and doctors who will look it over and say, there's merit to this case, and I think this award should be such and such. And then if you or I choose not to accept their recommendation, we can go to court. But if we go to court, the losing party needs to pay the expenses, the court costs, for both sides. We can do what they do at the University of Michigan now. It's a very interesting option. It's called apologize and compensate. At the University of Michigan, about 10 years ago, they started a program where the risk management people go through all the patients who suffer an adverse effect in the hospital. And what they do is they review it and they decide if there's liability there. And if there is, they do something exceedingly strange. They take the person, whether it be the doctor, the nurse, the therapist, and they make them go to the patient's bedside and apologize. Tell them what happened, apologize. And then the hospital offers them compensation for that injury. What that has done has significantly reduce not only the number of malpractice suits against the University of Michigan system, but it's significantly reduced their overall cost for health care. Third, we've got, we've got to protect doctors who are practicing evidence-based medicine. If doctors, we're not perfect. Medicine's still an art. But if we're practicing within evidence-based guidelines and there's an adverse effect, we need to be immunized. We need to be immunized against those suits. So yes, there are several things we can do. And lastly, is we need to make sure that the majority of whatever settlement actually goes to the injured party, to the patient, and not to their attorneys, and not to the conga line of expert medical witnesses who do nothing more than go from courtroom to courtroom to courtroom and say whatever they're told to say for a price. That's got to change. So yes, we can make a difference there. Now, where I live in Chico, I live in a small town of Chico. It's 100,000 people. We, have a, we have, actually have a very nice regional medical center. And we, um, we have a very good cancer center there. 
When I go to bed at night and climb into my bed and pull my sheets over me, within 35 miles of where I'm sleeping, there are five cancer centers. There's five cancer centers within 35 miles of my house. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but we don't have enough cancer to go around. So if you have some extra cancer, would you please send it up our way? Because we really need that. What we're doing, back to the market-based medicine, if a community hospital is in one community and wants to compete with another community hospital, they have to make sure that if we have a cancer center, they have a cancer center. If we have a neurotrauma ICU unit, they have to have a neurotrauma ICU unit. So we create these expensive edifices. We fill them with expensive, expensive machinery. We hire doctors that some of them that may not be very good but are looking for a job and we have to put a warm body in that spot. And then we go out and try to market that to the community like it's excellent care. Look, when I do a complex brain tumor surgery or I take care of a critically injured patient in our neurotrauma ICU, the more often that I do that, the better I get at it. And the better I get at it, the better the patient does, the better the outcomes. And the better the outcomes, the better the outcomes, the lower the costs. The shorter the hospitalizations and the lower costs. Regionalization needs to be part of this paradigm. Every single hospital doesn't have to be everything to everyone. And this isn't, I'm not just picking on cancer centers. This goes for joint replacement centers, for heart surgery, and the like. It's time that we started looking at, at geographic populations, creating centers of excellence, and making sure that high volumes were being done at those centers to improve those out, outcomes. So I think that regionalization is certainly important. Now, the third rail of healthcare reform, as I see it, has always been the discussion of how do we control the costs? And the one issue that nobody ever wants to talk about is rationing, rationing healthcare. Now look, you, have, you make so much money a, a month, you've gotta pay your rent, you gotta make your car payment, gotta get your food, gotta get your health insurance. You've gotta take your resources and you've got to allocate those resources appropriately, wisely. The same should be said for our healthcare system. We do not have infinite resources. We have finite resources. And what we need to do is make sure that we're better stewards of those finite resources. So that what we're spending on patients actually benefits them and not necessarily me. This is important. But you say the word healthcare rationing, and you get people like Sarah Palin starting to stand up and talking about euthanizing her child with Down syndrome or her elderly parents simply because the new health care law suggests that we should pay primary care physicians to have a discussion with their patients about <coughs> end-of-life issues. That kind of rhetoric has no place in this debate. You know, we can think about, sometimes we talk about rationing and everybody thinks about the 97-year-old woman that comes into the emergency room with a heart attack and has a bad ejection fraction and you and I and everybody else knows, all the evidence tells us the chances of her getting off the operating room table if we do a cardiac bypass is probably 1%. Should we be spending $150,000 for that 1% chance that this 97-year-old lady will survive? I'd like to. But if there's kids around this country that aren't getting their immunizations, I can't. That doesn't mean that she can't have the operation. Sure she can't. But if she wants that surgery, which has very little chance of success, let her or her family pay for it. Now the problem is the other end of the spectrum. How about the four-month-old? How about the four-month-old that was born with such severe, severe brain injury that their entire existence is nothing more than being ventilated through a tracheostomy tube, being fed through a feeding tube, who now comes into the emergency room for their fourth ventricular peritoneal shunt revision and infection at $125,000 a pop. If there's kids who aren't getting immunized, if there are women who, aren't, who need mammograms and can't get them, I can't pay for that. Now fortunately, folks, those decisions, which are always the basis of when we talk about rationing, those decisions are usually made properly. They're made properly between the, the clinician and a family. Although it's getting more difficult as that bond has been frayed. 
But most of those end of life decisions, we actually do pretty good at making those decisions. Where we're really losing the money is in the middle. On a Saturday morning, you go out in your backyard and you're maybe digging some fence post holes and you start to strain your low back. So on Monday morning, you walk into your primary care doctor's office and say, I want an MRI scan. So they get a $1,300 MRI scan. And you know, there's one of the rules about medical school is if you're a radiologist, the word normal is not in your vocabulary. <laughs> so they always find something, and when they find something, they send them to that guy that takes care of that something. So you come to see me, I'm a neurosurgeon, and I see this little annular tear in your disc space, and I'm thinking, geez, if I put you on ibuprofen and have you do some stretching exercises and send you to a Pilates class, I'll get paid about 40 bucks. If I do a discectomy on you, I'll get paid about you know, 800 bucks. Now, if I do a discectomy and then actually fuse you, now we're starting to talk real money. And then if I fuse you and decide I'm gonna use hardware and screws, now the premium goes up. And then if I decide, you know, if I fuse you from the front and from the back, a 360, it's fat city for me. This has gotta change. Evidence-based medicine should give us enough information that we know which patients require surgery and which patients re require less expensive care. But we don't have that. We have insurance companies that are on the television set telling you, guess what, buy our insurance. You don't need a referral to a specialist. You can go anytime you want. It's a complete waste of time. It's a complete waste. I'm a specialist, and yet I see about six or seven patients for everybody who I do a surgery on. And five of those six patients who I see who I don't operate on had no business seeing me in the first place. So we have got to do a better job of that. Now, those of you who kid yourself and think that we're not rationing in this country, I would just have you look to our neighbors to the west, I mean to the east, Arizona. A couple years ago, Arizona passed a law that stopped paying for transplants in their Medicaid population. And what has happened is that patients who were on waiting lists for liver transplants, their numbers came up, they checked into the hospital, and when the financial person came and looked at their figures and found that they were on Medicaid, they were sent home. And the next person on the list with private insurance got the liver, and they died. So we're rationing in this country on a daily basis, but we're doing it we're doing it in the cruelest and most unfair of ways, based on money, not on outcomes. And some of us have to stand up with the courage to say rationing is what we need to do. It makes it, don't use the term rationing. Let's allocate our resources reasonably. Um, in closing, I would suggest to you that this debate that we've had for the last four years on healthcare is, is essential essential to us as a country. It's, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican or you're a Tea Partier or you watch Fox News or you watch MSNBC or you listen to Nancy Pelosi or John Boehner. This is going to define who we are, not only to ourselves but to the world around us for generations to come. This debate, this debate isn't about people who have health insurance and are happy with it. This debate, this debate isn't about Nancy Pelosi. It's not about Sarah Palin. It's not about the Tea Party. This debate from day one has been about the have-nots. This debate has been about people who for years have been told, you don't get insurance because you have a pre-existing condition and you actually need medical care. This is a debate about people who are forced to sell their homes and everything their own because their 12-year-old son was unfortunate enough to develop cancer and is going to require an expensive, an expensive bone marrow transplant that is far beyond the limits of their insurance policies. This is about, this debate has been about people who are stuck in a job that they absolutely hate. They hate their job, but they have to stay there because their wife has breast cancer and she's getting treatments. And if they leave their job, they lose their insurance and she loses her treatments. Look, every single one of you in here, I'd venture to say we're all proud 
to stand up and to call ourselves Americans. We're proud to hold ourselves up to the world around us as a country, a country of greatness and a country of compassion. Well, this debate, I believe, is our chance to prove that. Thank you very much. Daly, do you want to? We have time for a few questions or comments. If, yes. Um, thank you for your provocative talk. Um, I'm interested in knowing, you know, should healthcare reform be tied to um, immigration reform? You talk about how there is 12 to 13 million um, immigrants, um, and you know, coming into this country, they're typically young and healthy. Therefore, they would decrease the um, risk pool for insurance. Um, what are ways do you think this could um, move forward in the future? And if it's, you know, is it practical? And, um, you know, if not now, when? Right. Well, the, the problem is that your question has to deal with two different issues, health care and immigration, probably two of the most um, divisive issues that we have in this country. And it's difficult to marry the two. And in, in actually, in my book, I have a chapter where I talk about what do we do with the illegals? And, I, you know, I, I'm going to admit to you, I don't know the answer to that. What I can tell you is that in other countries, what they do is if somebody gets sick or somebody gets hurt, they take care of them. They take care of them, and that's it. And they take care of them for free within their own healthcare system. We don't do that here. I, I gave a speech in Italy several years ago, and I actually, the day before my speech, fell down and broke my nose, had a cut, taken to an ambulance, had a CAT scan, a plastic surgeon, and an ENT guy see me. And I, I'm thinking, holy crying out loud, how am I going to pay for this? And I'm thinking my visa's only got so, many, you know, so much backup. So I kind of handed them my visa and closed my eyes, and they said, no, no cost. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is dumb. And they said, no. You know, people in our country are covered. Now, if, if I had high blood pressure or I had cancer and I wasn't in an emergency, they'd say, go back, to the, go back to the United States and get your care. But it's an emergency to take care of it. And I kind of think that's how we should be doing here. You know, until we get a good handle on how to reform the immigration system, at the very minimum, we can't deny care to people who need emergency care. But I'm not sure that we should be giving people who are breaking the law until the law is changed, if we should be giving them primary care, giving them blood pressure medicine. I think we should do the same thing that they do in other countries and say, this isn't an emergency, go back to your home and get your care. That's kind of the best way I can do that now until we figure out a better way of, of dealing with the immigration issue. Yes, ma'am. What do you think about the issue of fraud? There's been a lot of talk about Medicare fraud, and there's been some big cases that they've busted open. And I just want to hear your opinion about that. If we went to any of these solutions, what do you think? How do you think anti-fraud should be? Absolutely. You're correct. And the, I think the good news, I have good news for you. They're, they're moving in the right. And, and I've, George Bush, when he was as president, started this. And Barack Obama has continued it. And each year, the money available for the fraud and abuse department is increasing. Now, I don't know what the current problems going on, if they're going to tighten it down. But they're making excellent progress at that. But, you know, there is so much fraud. And part of that comes back to the, you know, can you imagine them on, average, on television saying, get your motorized wheelchair. You don't have to pay a thing. Now, how many people are driving around in these motorized wheelchairs that cost several thousand dollars, that don't have to pay a thing for them, that don't even need them? You know? I, I just don't think, I don't think medicine should be marketed. I'll decide if you need a motorized wheelchair. And, and then there's outright fraud that's, that and they are doing a much better job of controlling that now. So I, I think that there's something good on the horizon there. Yes? Are there any examples at the state level where they're doing it right or could be used, used as a model of <laughs> direction we should be going? Well, you know, with the new health care law, everybody's scrambling. and Everybody's coming up with different ideas. California is pretty progressive. Probably the state that I would say, if I was looking at a state, Minnesota. I think Minnesota does a pretty good job. People have asked me, what's the ideal model for health care? And I'm going to suggest to you that it's an HMO. And everyone's going, are you kidding me? There's three, three groups that I, that I hold up as a great example. Kaiser Permanente, the Cleveland Clinic, 
the Mayo Clinic. These are three really good examples of high quality medicine at reasonable cost with good outcomes. Now what do they have in common? Number one, all three of those entities are nonprofit. Number two, all three of those entities salary their doctors. They're not fee for service. They pay them, but they also salary them very well. And they, pray, they, they bring high quality docs into their program. And number three, and are the most important, is that the primary care doctors actually keep the gate. The gatekeepers actually keep the gate. They sit down with their patients, they talk to their patients, and they determine whether they need a test or whether they need to see a specialist. That's where the, those systems really work. And that's very highly, um, those systems are very highly uh, uh, represented in, in Minnesota. Yes, ma'am? What about Massachusetts? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I think Massachusetts is, is on its way. They're still in that, you know, Minnesota's had this, had this experience now for some time, which is why I think that they're kind of held up as, as the country's leader. But Massachusetts, since, since Romney started that, that healthcare system in Massachusetts, you know, it's moving in the right direction. It's got its, it's, got its, uh, its flaws, but there seem to be addressing those flaws as they come along, which is what my hope is for the new health care law. You know, people are saying, why don't we just repeal this and start over? No way. I mean, I'm going to tell you, if we repeal this, the American public does not have the stomach to go through this crap, and they won't for another 25 years. So it's bad, it's flawed, but it's a start. And I think it's incumbent upon us to make it better. Thank you. Very balanced and reasonable. Um, I would like to follow up on the last issue, and that is the question of whether we will ever get to Medicare for all or a single payer system, or whether there is sufficient improvement in the Affordable Care Act that it will simply delay our getting to that point. And I guess my question is, um, what do you think is possible in the system you propose, which is not to repeal and to simply modify over time, versus um, <clears throat> if the current Affordable Care Act were uh, found to be unworkable, and then we do have to start over with a, Something uh, else. an attempt at uh, a single payer. Well, like I said, as a citizen, as a patient, I'd vote for single payer. As a doctor, I'm not sure I would. Um, I don't think, I mean, if you stop and think, uh, you know, we have a, this health care law you know, is flawed. But there's a lot of things that, that are like uncontroversial that became controversial. Single payer is huge. And single payer is going to be be rated as socialized medicine. And I think y you and I are not going to see it in our lifetimes. Maybe our grandchildren, maybe our kids, but I don't think we're going to see it. Uh, you know, I, there isn't any state, there's states that are talking about it. But nobody's really implemented it yet. And so I, I, I just don't know where it's going to go. And, you know, every year they keep trying and knocking on the door, but there's a, a lot of problems with it. And, and there's a lot of money, much more money opposing it, that's going to be the big um, barrier to considering single payer. So oh, absolutely. And although <clears throat> Obama himself had said early on that single payer probably was the best system. Um, the question is, could he possibly have gotten single payer had he lived up to his own desire for perfection, or <laughs> the perfect have been the enemy of the good? Well, you know, it's interesting because the Democrats have always been the heart and soul of the single payer camp, and yet when Max Baucus was, who's the senator from um, 
Wyoming or North Dakota, when Max Bacchus was put ahead of, of putting together this, this Affordable Care Act, he got up and the very first day he said, look, everything is going to be on the table. We're going to think about everything. We're going to be open to every idea except a single pair. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm hearing this from the, from the crib of the Democratic Party. Chances a single payer are making much progress isn't very, much, very bright. If we were to simply remove the age restriction on the government, the Medi Medicare, yeah. uh, is the problem that we wouldn't have enough money in the, to compete with the private sector because the everybody will use. Yeah, well, the money's there. And the, OK, if, if, you if you want to say, OK, I got $2.6 trillion to spend, you could spend it. I mean, if you read the single payer people, or you know, Medicare for all people, they tell you it's the money's there because there's all these savings because of, they're going to be able to negotiate better contracts with docs and hospitals and pharmaceutical companies, and all the money that's currently been put in the system by the employers is still going to be put in the system. You're just shifting it from a for-profit insurance model to a, a more neutral, um, better model than that. It was interesting, I, I, I gave a speech uh, a year or so ago to a group of professors, um, UC professors, and afterwards this woman came up to me and said, you know, I loved your talk. There's always that but, but. And she said, I loved your talk, but um, I disagreed with what you said about having a role of government in healthcare. And I said, I get that all the time. I understand why you do that. And she says, well, I don't want the government touching my healthcare. I love my healthcare. I said, well, um, is it affordable? Yes. Can you see any doctor you want? Yes. So you're happy with it? She says, yes. And, and I'm afraid if we let the government in it, they'll screw it up. So I said, well, who's your insurance company? And she said, Medicare. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, <laughs> you've enlightened us. And we would never make that mistake again in talking to you. Uh, talking from our colleagues and friends, thank you so thank much. Thank you, yeah. Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you.